This is Saori Kobayashi, and you are listening to Pixelated Audio. Welcome to Pixelated Audio, a podcast focusing on game audio, its history, and the people behind it. We're your hosts. I'm Gene, and this is Brian. Welcome back. It feels weird to be recording again. It's been... A couple uh, of months. It's been uh, a, a little while. We had, uh, what, four episodes we recorded, three episodes we recorded back-to-back, uh, and it's nice to be able to talk to you in person again it's been a while so yeah i'm happy to be here first time in the podcasting studio we uh, recorded in a remote location the last time so the last few times so yeah, yeah yeah so this is our first time back in the old digs yep and it's gonna be an awesome episode because today we're gonna be playing music and talking about panzer dragoon saga or azel panzer dragoon rpg in japan and later on in the show we're gonna be talking to saori kobayashi the lead composer of the game, who we were lucky enough to interview in person at Mag West when she came over this year as a guest. So I don't want to pat myself on the back too much, but I did help some of that relationship, and it was an absolute honor to have her come and speak to her in person and listen to her fabulous concert that right. went on. Right, right, right. So we recorded the interview a day before her live show. Yeah, and, that was back in September. Right, and we are doing the follow-up, finally getting able to get together and and record the the actual show uh, today. So I'm excited. Uh, There's a lot of really great music here and I'm excited to talk about it. So the track that brought us in was Eche Valde Generos El, or Behold the Precious Wings. It was written by the co-composer Mariko Nanba and arranged by Hayato Matsuo. Mariko Nanba only wrote a few of the tracks in the game, but they're some of our favorites and we've actually included a few of them in the show. Yeah, we didn't want to leave any out because some of them are really excellent and i think that uh she made a an excellent contribution to the soundtrack and um i think that the these three people kind of combined did um just this game a lot of justice definitely so, it's it's a really it's one of my favorite soundtracks still to this day one of my favorite soundtracks it's actually one of my favorite games in rpgs of all time i mean it's been a while since i've actually played through it um i have put in quite a few hours in you know preparation for this episode but uh, it was a game that I, you know, I loved. It's the bottom of my heart. It's just always sat there. And so I'm really excited that we're going to be finally diving into it today and talking about it. Definitely. Me too. So Panzer Dragoon Saga is a Japanese RPG released in 1998 for the Sega Saturn in Japan, the US, and Europe. It borrows some elements from its rail shooter prequels for a semi-real-time battle system, but in a much larger RPG adventure spanning four discs. The game was published by Sega and developed by Team Andromeda, one of Sega's in-house development studios. Now, Sega comes up so many times. In fact, we even talked about them last time when we were talking with Chibi Tech. It was a really excellent show, but we're not going to go over Sega in great detail, but we will just sort of talk a little bit more about Team Andromeda. Yeah, so Team Andromeda was a short-lived division within Sega, part of Sega's consumer research and development department. I don't want to break down the entirety of the company and its numerous divisions, uh, because in past episodes we've mentioned that there's kind of two different general parts of Sega's software. There's the Sega Amusement Machine R&D division, focusing primarily on arcade machine content, like Sega AM1, uh, 2, and 3, etc., And then Sega's consumer group, which is Sega CS, focusing on the console stuff. 
Team Andromeda spawned from Sega CS in 1994 as a group solely focused on the Panzer Dragoon series, starting with the first game entry in 1995, and continued as the successor group from Sega CS1 for Panzer Dragoon's Y and Saga. Yeah, sort of a continuation, but essentially the same team. Right, right. So around the time Panzer Dragoon Saga was released, many of the staff from Team Andromeda were absorbed back into the parent department or other departments around Sega, and some moved to Smilebit, another internal Sega department, which worked on Panzer Dragoon Orta and the Jet Set Radio series later on. <laughs> Definitely a good so, pedigree there. Yeah, so they've kind of, the, like these, a lot of these engineers and um designers and stuff work together and they kind of just bounced around the company with each other in this kind of tight knit circle. So it's pretty awesome. That they were able to essentially, you know, form this team and keep these bonds strong, uh, the force strong uh, between them as they kind of danced around the company. Yeah. Like that. A lot of the folks in smile bit went on to work on Panther Dragoon Orta. So they sort of continued with that same collective force throughout the series. Right, right, right. So, the one thing that we wanted to bring up a little bit early is the soundtrack release for this, because this game is, it, it's really a massive scale game, even though it's kind of a limited release in the West. Yeah. The soundtrack was released five different times now. I mean, it's it's pretty incredible. So there, the first release was a Zell Panzer Dragoon RPG. It was 18 tracks released in December of 1997 prior to the game's release. Uh, it was another disc bundled with that that included like a demo of the game so you could get your hands you know, get your mouth wet or whatever the saying sure. is. It's like a sampler. Yeah, 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 it's a sampler, right? And then the uh, Azel Panzer Dragoon RPG Complete album was released a few months later, a month after the game was released in Japan in February of 1998. And this is a two-disc set of about 60 tracks and arrangements. Then Azel Panzer Dragoon RPG Memorial album was released in 2001, again, 60 tracks. And then just, uh, I think a few years later, I'm sorry, 17 years later, <laughs> Azel Panzer Dragoon RPG original soundtrack was a download only release uh, in 2018. Sort of a few years ago, a re-release digitally for the people that couldn't get the vinyl or CD or whatever it was. <laughs> right, 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 right. So in the same year, just last year, Resurrection Panzer Dragoon Saga 20th Anniversary Arrangement Album was released. And this was a, a huge release by Brave Wave. They put it out on vinyl. They have a download version, I think, on Bandcamp um, through their, their website. And uh, CDs are offered. And this was kind of a retelling of a lot of the original tracks. Yeah, a modernization, a little bit of basically taking the vision of Panther Dragoon Saga forward into the present, but still retaining a lot of the original character of the songs. Right. And we'll hear more about this as we kind of get through um, to the interview section and also as we listen together through some of these tracks that we play. That first track that we heard was actually from the title screen of the game. And I think it's a really good way to create this atmosphere in this world for what you're about to experience i mean you don't really see much it's just like the title screen which looks really pretty but then like press start but like you get these kind of um tribal sounds and, uh, and vocals vocals yeah, yeah. and stuff and it just uh, i think it sets everything up it's a really nice intro yeah this actually comes after uh, an intro cut scene and then you're sort of brought to this static screen with like basically hieroglyphs in the background and the panzer dragoon logo and the first time I heard it, it was like, I, I'm hearing the, the the influences of like the desert that you're going to be spending a lot of time in and this really epic sound that swells to just almost at a breaking point. And I was so I was so taken with this. I pretty much just sat and listened to the music until until it stopped before I pressed start. Yeah, I was so excited when I got this game because I got it when it when it came out. I was so excited that I uh, immediately started playing, but. I went back and listened to it. <laughs> yeah, I played I it many too, years was... later when I was already really into video game music, so I knew this was a game that had a lot of uh, legacy to it. Right, right, right. So let's get into our next track. This is composed by Saori Kobayashi. This is titled Premonition of War.
That was Premonition of War, composed by Saori Kobayashi for Panzer Dragoon Saga on the Sega Saturn. Uh, that is one of those tracks that puts me in a very specific time and place. I played this many years after. It was brand new. Mm -hmm. But it reminds me of the late 90s, of, of like the, I don't know, it, there's... There's something about the digital artifacting and the compression that just is very warm in, in a weird way. I don't know. I, yeah, I know it I know works in mean. its favor in I know this what you mean. game. I know what you mean. And for me, the Saturn is a, like a good warming feeling, kind of like what you're describing. And I think a lot of it attributes to this game because this is one of like my very fond memories of the system and why I'm still a fan and collect for it. And uh, so I, I, th I think I know what you mean um, yeah. in that in that situation. Not necessarily the compression, but like just the almost kind of rusticness to the instruments. Not just her style, but just to the sound as, as in general, I guess. Yeah, there's a there's like a haziness to this track, like the between the reverb and the 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 present drums, which almost are like a crashing wave that just kind of come back and bring your focus to the foreground. And you've got these big sweeping strings and and horns and the vocals sort of it's a very it, it's it's kind of like an amorphous sound you're you're not exactly grounded anywhere which i really really like and there's a there's a good reason why you're not grounded yeah. in the music i wonder because, why that is well, because, <laughs> you know because the game primarily or not i wouldn't say primarily but a good portion of the game takes place in flight and so i think this kind of uh, feeling of uh, our music goes hand in hand with the experience that the player is going through as you journey through, you know, this really kind of almost post apocalyptic scape, you know? Yeah. But let's talk about Saori Kobayashi. We're going to be talking about her later on in the show or talking with her later on in the show. So we should bring up some of her early history first. Yeah, yeah. She got her start working at Sega in the early 90s. Her first major game project was composing the music for Inspector Gadget on the Super Nintendo. Kind of a lot of remixes of some of the classic tunes from the show. Mm -hmm. uh, during the mid 90s, she composed a lot of Game Gear tunes, some pretty notable ones too. Deep Duck Trouble, starring Donald Duck, Sonic Triple Trouble, Sylvan Tail, and Sonic Drift 2. Sylvan Tail is a pretty good and well-known soundtrack, uh, even though the game never came out here, right? Yeah, that's one of those recovered via emulation. It got It's one of those few gems of the Game Gear that's really worth tracking down. Yeah, do you want to listen to a snippet of it? Yeah, if you've got something. Might as well. <laughs> That's the overworld of Sylvan Tell. It's pretty rad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's uh, the Game Gear. I've actually been listening through a lot of those. There's not too many standout soundtracks, but this is definitely one you should check out. I think so. Uh, well, I guess we're just going to have to do it at some point. Then. Yeah. <laughs> out of the list, out of the slush pile, as they say in HG 101. <laughs> so, uh, one last one I wanted to mention is uh, right after Azel, she worked on Shadowgate 64, which came out in 1999. It's not really a well-remembered game, but it's a really good soundtrack, and it has totally. a lot of that same kind of sound that you'll find here in, in Panzer Dragoon Saga or right. Azel. Right. So uh, throughout the show and during the interview, we're going to talk more about her later projects, but let's move back over to Azel and talk about the story a little bit. Yeah, I uh, was digging through the manual, and I found the story. I don't know if I'm going to read all of this, but there's some really cool world building here. This is one of these things that we don't see as much because a lot of it happens in cutscenes or promotional videos, but I, I really like the way they described the world of Panzer Dragoon Saga. So if, do you mind if I read a little bit of this? Go for it. Go for it. I was going to say we could just talk about it too, because I mean, I have very fond memories of this game. So, But yeah, please. Yeah, yeah I'm it. not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to read like little excerpts from it. So the skin of the earth is arid and cracked, swept bare by dry winds and scorched by the pitiless sun. Deep beneath its surface, the buried ruins of an ancient age for eons lay waiting. 
it's so wow. like Dude, that's, so, okay that's better than i would have that's said. way more poetic <laughs> than you would expect for for a, for yeah, a game of really that good. era that's really good so you know it goes on from there long mute artifacts give testimony to a lost golden age of man they speak of the great and foolish pride that drove our forebears to explore the paths only the gods were meant to tread and create life forms beyond nature's intent and they tell of the struggle between man's last great empire and the creations which had escaped his control. Keep going, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Keep going. Well, I think, Keep going. I, I think we can just sort of talk about the game from now. So, so basically the world of Panzer Dragoon Saga is this post-apocalypse, but not in the dramatic sense. It's like a world in that's rebuilding. Right. There right, are right, right. settlements. There are people. There, there's sort there, of... There's kind of an empire and... Yeah. And... Um, but the remaining human settlements are very spread apart. They're not very large. There's kind of the, in the cliche way of video games, the ancient technology that's been uncovered, which the empire is now taking into well, control. Well, they're they're uncovering it. Yeah, right? yeah. So, the the game kind of opens up to you. the The main player of the game, uh, his name is Edge, and you don't really know much about what he's doing, but you can kind of gather that he is. Um, uh, like a like a hired hand, really working for the empire at an excavation site, mm-hmm. and they are trying to uncover, you know, these lost artifacts or ancient technology from a civilization that was obliterated or what have you. And that's why you know we say that the game takes place in this post-apocalyptic kind of landscape, but it's not really like post-apocalyptic like you would think, like you know, on Earth, if like just everything was scorched and we started over. It's it's almost like its own world that mm-hmm. they've created too. So it, it, you know, there's obviously there's there's dragons and there is just um, kind of insane weapons, but there's a lot of this really kind of tribal, uh, simpler style of um, uh, oh, yeah. humanity and stuff at the same time, civilizations. There's a lot of these nomadic groups throughout the game that you meet in right. small encampments and some of them are traveling throughout the world. And the you know I did mention I said it's a sort of a cliche story in video games but it's presented in such a good way you're kind of not really told anything you are for all you know you're edge you're at this excavation site then a battle takes place and you're kind of caught by surprise you get knocked underground you find this this dragon who's Who, friendly to yeah, you. you kind of befriend yeah and create this bond somehow <laughs> yeah it's sort of almost this immediate thing you're you're in this chasm in the dark you're, you don't know what's going on and we you, should yeah. we should mention though that the the intro is um like a full cutscene with uh voices and everything and they all speak in a fabricated language which is kind of like um panzeries it? it's called panzeries so yeah, yeah yeah it's it's based on greek right like ancient greek Greek, Latin, Russian, it's kind of this weird mixture of the rules of language, the way like Tolkien would sort of create his own language. Right. They had a similar thing here where it's it sounds familiar to your ear, but it's not really a, a I know, real language. I, you know, I, I, every time I heard it, I was like, what? What, the, what are these saying? Like, <laughs> I feel like I know because the, they say every once in a while, they'll say a word that like you can catch, like they'll say a player's name or something like edge. And you're like, oh, I, I understood yeah. that word. <laughs> um, but uh, it's it's an awesome experience because you feel like you're in this other world that it's not like, it's not like something that you can understand. And it's not, it's not a language that you know exists. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So yeah. it's, it's got this very, um, just almost, I wouldn't say alien feel to it, but like, Almost like unfamiliar. Star Wars. Yeah, yeah unfamiliar yeah. or something. Yeah, I, it's it's a, kind of like a cross between Star Wars and Dune, sort of, but with dragons. Right. In, in, a, in a weird, <laughs> it's its own thing. It's like kind right. of a weird mix of ancient and technological and nature versus science. Like a lot of these creatures, the dragons and some of the things that you fight are these bio mutants. They're a, like a weird genetic offshoot or mutation of a lot of these things. Right. Which leads us directly into our next track. <laughs> let's let's talk more about. It. There's so much to talk about this game, but let's keep going on with the, the music. Otherwise, we're going to go forever here. This is uh, mutation or metamorphosis, as it is called, an alternative title. Right, and this is composed by Saori Kobayashi. So let's take a listen.
That was Mutation 1, or Metamorphosis, composed by Saori Kobayashi for Panzer Dragoon Saga on the Sega Saturn. This is one of the first tracks you're going to hear in the game. We, we talk about like the indigenous kind of sound uh, of uh, or the, the world that she's kind of created and the designers have created. And um, I think that there's, there's almost no better track than this one to convey this this feeling but also have a little bit of urgency so when you start the game and you get thrown on you know in the seat of the dragon Mm -hmm. and you start flying around your first battle the tutorial and everything is this track and so this is where you're just like oh my god like i can move around i can do all this stuff and it harkens back to the earlier game so if you were a fan of panzer dragoon or zwei this would feel so in place and at home, but yet have like this new take on that experience, that rail shooter. So um, without getting too much into those other games right now, uh, it, it, this this sound kind of just brings me back into that moment. Yeah, and it's sort of an extension of Premonition of War until you get hit with that B section. Oh, every time I get to there, it's just the melodic figures just hit me in like the most positive way. It reminds me of some of the best moments in like Chrono Trigger, right? where there's these really unusual chords and changes, and it's just so powerful to me. Every time I hear it, it's I just I want to close my eyes and just focus on the music. It's for so early in the game. I think it's a really really fantastic track. Right. We talked earlier about the the difference um, with you know the different ancient technologies and the the tribal kind of infusion of the game, but the the sound doesn't really encompass a lot of the more technological advanced kind of sound you know what i mean there's you don't hear these really not yet um yeah these really wailing synths and stuff early on in the game everything seems simplistic it seems like you're in this very kind of old rustic world and that's not always the case so i think as we get you know deeper into the soundtrack we're going to start seeing more pieces of this world kind of unfold too yeah and you start off more in like deserts and canyons very much more in the natural world and as yeah as you progress you go more into this mechanized digital world so before we talk more about the game let's play another track this is the chaos within the silence Just heard the chaos within the silence composed by Saori Kobayashi. Hmm. I'm so happy with the picks we have for this show. It's it's such a we have a good selection. I think we went yeah. through it together. I mean, it's well, like two months ago now. We were going through 60 tracks to try to find out the the best ones, and all of them like are all of them are really good and kind of stand on their own. Some of them have a lot of the same kind of essence or nuance that 
other tracks have and so it's really hard to pick the best combo but the ones that hit us that we were sitting i remember we we're sitting down um, downstairs on the the kitchen table and we had our headphones on and we were i think we had our yeah our headphones on we we're kind of closing our eyes and we we're just like yep this thumbs one, thumbs this up one, thumbs this, down we were yeah. it was sort of like yeah it was we had our little draft picks i think a few we had a few each that we wanted but in any case, I want to say, we didn't mention it in the previous tracks, but the panning percussion throughout the soundtrack, I think goes a really long way to giving that sort of enveloping sound that really draws you into the game. It's a, uh, it can be a little bit of a cheap trick to use panning percussion, but it works so well in this game that it doesn't I, bother I think, me at all. I think that's kind of the, um, kind of the idea, right? So the panning percussion in this sen sense to me is... Um, because it has that that very um, tribalistic kind of feel, it almost sounds like I'm at some event, or there's there's people who are playing but dancing around me, and I, you know it's it has this stereoscopic like warmth. I think and I don't. Know. I think it adds to that sense of weightlessness and that swirling that that really works well when you're flying around a dragon. Totally, totally. So uh, talking about the the dragon and the gameplay. Uh, the game is broken up into several different gameplay styles. Um, there's a free flying mode where you explore large 3D maps and dungeons on your dragon, collecting items and generally progressing through the game. You spend the bulk of the time on your dragon and in this mode, or a good portion of it. Yeah, a lot of the main gameplay where you fight your random battles takes place on this mode. So you collect items while you can find hidden passageways. Sometimes you can just fly around and, and kind of enjoy the experience of this free motion of right. the dragon. Right. Early on in the game, the feeling is, or the, the, the landscape is a little bit bleak. And I think that the reason why is to just not overwhelm the character too much. You're coming from like this desert, you know, you were knocked into this, uh, you know, excavation site and you're just kind of emerging from it with this dragon. And so it just, it's very easy to, um, kind of see where you're going and, and kind of get a sense as you go through the tutorials and you take on these really pr pretty easy um, enemies. Yeah, I mean, they ramp it up pretty slowly, so you kind of get the feel of flying around on the dragon. And as I mentioned before, the game's battle system also takes place on the dragon. There are these random encounters, which you get while you're exploring in this free-flying mode. It features this really innovative combat system where you position your dragon in the cardinal directions, northeast, southwest, or, you know, up, down, left, right, and you can either avoid attacks and deal extra damage, or if you are in the line of sight of the enemy, you'll take extra damage. So, I, I want to yeah. tack onto this because th that that sounds a little bit. It's hard to visualize, you know, the north, south, east, and west aspects of moving around. But essentially, what you're doing is it's almost like a waltz between you and your enemies. Yeah, and you're both trying to take uh, get the vantage point, right? So if you're in the dragon and you're on the, you know, you have a enemy on your left side, you can. Uh, reposition yourself to be behind the enemy, which mm -hmm. might be its weak point or something like that, or in front of the enemy and shoot at its face. Or the enemy might try to move around you to shoot at, you know, your weak point with its, its strong arm or something like that. And so it's this kind of uh, almost uh, there's like a sword fight between Yeah, there's a push two. and pull, and it changes constantly. So the enemy's super attack, it might be vulnerable for like the equivalent of a turn or two but as soon as it's done you're now in a danger position right and i think the battle system you know being an rpg this time around takes a lot of the early influences from the the first and second game and incorporates them into this really awesome semi semi real-time kind of turn-based system and it just works so well but there's a lot of depth to the battle system which we'll talk more about later Lastly, there's on foot sections where you control the protagonist's edge through towns or um, different different landscapes. You know, you can land your dragon and and kind of walk around on foot. And this is really cool because if you're using the uh, Saturn 3D controller, mm -hmm, you can yeah. move the joystick. Or I mean, back then that was it was, that was a, it was an innovation. Yeah, uh, that was an innovation. It basically looks like a Dreamcast controller. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I actually had one of those because of Nights into Dreams. I got one right over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. For I mean, sure. it's it's the kind of stuff that you'd expect from a JRPG. You can go into town. You can buy items and weapons. You can complete little side quests. Talk uh, to NPCs. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And there's these little camps where you can kind of hang out and 
spend the night and chill with your dragon. This is where you save your game. Right. You can pet it and you develop a bond with it, which is actually an important gameplay thing, but it's it's sort of a cute thing to do anyway. It yeah. makes these little cooing sounds. <laughs> yep. And there's also a world map which connects all of the various dungeons and settlements and stuff, but it's primarily for... Uh, world building as you travel from area to area in just like a matter of seconds. So it's kind of like fat. It's like fast travel. Yeah, you just like thing. have this little dragon that you move from one spot to another. It's really not part of the game other than just to show that it's one big interconnected world. Right, 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 right. So, but you still f- pretty much fly through all the different areas to to get to the next area. You still have to do all the work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You like, have to unlock the new areas. And then once you're done, you can go back to places very quickly. Right. So let's take a listen to our next track here. This is called Giant Creature, composed by Saori Kobayashi. Giant Creature, composed by Saori Kobayashi. This is the first boss battle, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I think the boss is actually stationary, so you don't get so overwhelmed. Because a lot of the bosses move around, like we talked about. Yeah. But this one, you kind of just like move around it, but it stays in place. Right, right. I I like this boss battle, actually. I thought it was pretty... I I was pretty impressed when I first saw it. And I, I think the music, too, is... You know, it's got these really dissonant parts, but the flute, or what a pan flute that, you know kind of makes a return is is always uh, welcome I, I really like that yeah for me this those track, rata drums man those rata drums. <laughs> the rata drums every episode's got to have a gabriel knight reference it sounds like <laughs> what i love about this track is you're lucky if you have like two good boss themes in a game and there's so many good boss themes in this one this is this is the first boss and it's just i i just feel this sense of not triumph exactly but you feel powerful as you're fighting this enemy because you're you're not that strong, but you're stronger than this enemy, and the music just perfectly barely, matches. Kind of yeah, feeling, ba- barely. Yeah. But but you're, you're on a dragon. It's super cool. And here's your first real challenge. But you feel like you're up to the task. You can do it. You can overcome. Right. And speaking of dragon too, this dragon feels more like a horse, like a pet. <laughs> yeah. Right? You know, it's it's not like a it's not like a scary looking dragon. This is like it kind of looks like a. It's like, like an was, elephant size. Like, yeah, wise. like I was like I was gonna no, compare no, it to like not a, even that big. Like a brontosaurus. Yeah. Like, you know, like a <laughs> like a plant eater dragon. <laughs> it just looks like a nice, happy dragon. <laughs> but um so I think you don't have this sense of like badassery yet. It's more of like I, I got my my steed and we're gonna like do the best we can and we might not make it, but you know, you don't have that like I'm just gonna go in and and with fire blazing and take everybody out it doesn't have that feeling 
Yeah, you start off pretty weak, actually, uh, and your your skills develop over the game. You you learn new abilities and all of that, and it's just Edge and the Dragon. It's a little bit like an early version of Shadow of the Colossus. In, there's in a no, way. yeah, there's no <laughs> there's no party system. You're not getting new people. I think some like NPCs will fight with you in certain situations a couple of I, times, if I yeah, remember. Yeah. But you don't control them. Um, so it's it's basically just you and uh, your dragon the entire time. So I wanted to dive a little bit into the battle system because it's such a cool system and it's really, I'm right, not we've gonna, already mentioned a few things about yeah. it, but there is, there's so much depth there. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to talk about it at great length because it's really better experienced, but just to give people an idea in case you never get a chance to play it. So the way it works is you have these meters that are constantly filling up. So it is semi real time, kind of like the active time battle and final fantasy games. You have three bars that are filling up. So most of your basic actions take one move or one bar. So you can fire Edge's gun with the A button, which and the guns are switchable. You can change those in battle. You can fire the dragon's lasers with the B button and the C button is the battle menu. So you can use items which cure your status or heal your character. And some of the more powerful attacks can take two or three, but you generally want to save those for boss battles. You don't usually use those too much during the random encounters. Right. Every time you move your character, it doesn't take any bar, but it stops it from filling. So you want to be careful about moving around too much because the enemy's bar is constantly filling. It's invisible, right. but it's, right, it's right. still are able to take actions. Right. So you have this radar. It's kind of like it's, a, it's just a momentary. I kind of want to go back oh, to yeah, that. It's sorry. just a momentary. Um, it's a momentary pause of the bar filling up, but it's just enough to where the enemy might have an edge on top of you. You know what I mean? Yeah, so. being the person to get the first attack in might be the difference between taking a lot of damage and being in a safe zone and avoiding it altogether. Right, right. So the combat radar is a little bit like a submarine radar system. You can see your dragon and there is a color system in play so if you're in a green zone it's player advantage you deal more damage you take less damage sometimes you don't take any damage at all red is enemy advantage you ge you generally want to stay out of that and when it's clear that's kind of neutral so neither person neither player or enemy really has any power advantage a lot of the later enemies don't have as many of those safe zones and more and more of the red zones as you get further into the game so based on which enemies you're fighting in which attacks they are using, the quadrants will change quickly. Sometimes there'll be just one area, one quarter that's danger. Sometimes it's the whole screen and you're just going to have to take a hit. Right. And enemies will fly behind you. They'll, they'll move. And that's that whole thing about that, that ballet we talked about. You constantly have to be balancing. Well, if I move, then I will lose the advantage of the movement, but I need to move out of the way of the attack. So it's kind of, it's a very strategic game in that way. The positioning is very important. Right. And... As you play, you get better at finishing battles quickly. So if you do a lot of damage to enemies very quickly without taking a lot of damage, you'll get an excellent score. It's like a grading system. Yeah, yeah. you get a little bit more experience and sometimes better items. So you generally are encouraged to do better in battle. And it's not even that big of a deal if you don't do well. But yeah, like, what does it actually do? Do you get more experience? Or you do. It's like a percentage multiplier. Maybe you get 100 experience points as a baseline. And it's like 115 versus oh. like 90 yeah, if you do I really can't, poorly. I can't even remember. It's been so long. So it's not a yeah. big deal, and it's it's not like you don't get penalized too much. But it's it's sort of a light encouragement to to get good at the battle system. Right. I think the battle system in this game is excellent, and uh, if you played the previous games, you you would know what to expect. I mean, honestly, if you played the previous games and you haven't played this one something's wrong with you because like <laughs> like the, i think they they continuously just got better and this is like a like the kind of quintessential panzer dragoon game i i really think so or I do too did you play you played order and i did i just played it a couple of weeks ago it's it's a beautiful looking game yeah it's great it's great i just think that you know i still think this is like where it it got its legs and eh, you know it's a bit weird going back to the rail shooter even though it's a really good game coming from this rpg which is massive and you know it's like 15 20 hours long and there's this whole world building it's 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 kind of a jump actually to go back and forth between the two styles right and and i think that so yeah every game was is is different they're they're not the same characters or same dragons even um i think that i think that there's actually an order though like like one is first two is second then i actually think two takes place before oh, one it's like this weird right, story right, right. jump yeah that's right that's right so two is the first one then one and then i think immediately after one is where saga where takes saga place. yeah picks up yeah so um there is some kind of continuity between the 
the the games but i i don't think it's it doesn't really yeah, matter that it doesn't, much it doesn't matter game, at yeah. all no 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 because i think i mean just even what you've read in the about the story that's like all you need to know to get into it so and the cutscenes are very very long and for the saturn's memory it's it's incredible like that they were able to put so much detail into it especially not you know being a very strong 3d system yeah you know, and that's so. why it's four discs because of all of the the cutscenes <laughs> and the CGI, stuff they had yeah. to get into we'll talk more about the graphics and stuff later but let's get into another track so the first track we played of the game was done by mariko namba and uh, we said that we had a few more tracks from her this is another one from her called rest and this is an excellent one so let's take a listen and we'll be right back <laughs> That was Rest, composed by Mariko Namba for Azel Panzer Dragoon RPG. What I love about this track is it's like you can imagine a folk music troupe in this sort of alien world that's not quite Earth, sitting around a campfire playing their folk instruments. You've got the guitar, the kind of the flute, the zither sound. They're playing this very simple folk melody, but it's very, very compelling. You sort of you hear it every time it comes that was around. Good imagery. I was picturing a fire play, like you know, around a <laughs> campfire. It's yeah, and it's a very restful track. There's some um, a lot more amped up stuff that we've heard so far that you know you hear during gameplay, and you know it's not like town music. This is something that is supposed to give you the sense of kind of like peace sleep calm or, yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah this so. does play in those camp scenes where you can pet your dragon there's no other npcs you're just it's it's a very small area usually it's like one screen large and, right and maybe there's a campfire maybe it's just like a grassy field sometimes it's in a canyon but it's it's meant to be this very just sort of a breather right right yeah so Mariko Namba uh, might be a familiar name if you're a fan of Sega. Best known for her work on some of the titles in the Sonic the Hedgehog series, she got her start in piano at a young age and carried it into college where she attended Tokyo Conservatory Shobi, the College of Music. She got her start at Sega, I believe during college or directly after in 1994, after sending an impressive demo tape with her first role doing sound mastering for Panic on the Sega CD. Did you ever play Panic? I did not. Oh my God, it is so fun. It's the stupid, like that game should have never have made it to the West. It's totally a Japanese like style game. It's up. You basically just push buttons and wait for like silly crap to happen. Oh, oh! I think I remember it. Is it uh, like an, not an FMV game, but you play as like a little boy in, in yes. overalls? I never played it, but I saw a couple of clips and I'm like, what is this? Okay, so next time you come over, we're playing it. All right. <laughs> we're going to go through it. <laughs> Anyways, so she did sound mastering for that. Uh, Knuckles Chaotix, she also worked on Space Channel 5 Part 2, Billy Hatcher and the Giant Egg, Sonic Heroes, Feel the Magic, Shadow the Hedgehog, Sonic the Hedgehog, Sonic Rush Adventure, and both the Wii and DS versions of Sonic Colors. Interestingly, she's also been part of a dojin group called Nano Sounds under the alias No Sleeves. So she's all over the place doing music. It's really cool to kind of see that connection even to the uh, 
the Dojin groups. Yeah, I'm not as familiar with her stuff. I haven't listened to the more recent Sonic games, but she's done quite a bit of work there, so I'm definitely going to take some time to listen. I know Sonic 06 doesn't have the best reputation as a game, but I've heard the soundtrack's actually pretty good. All the Sonic, all the Sonic soundtracks have been pretty good. They all, yeah. They're all pretty Pretty good. much all. Yeah. So I wanted to briefly mention Hayato Matsuo. He we, haven't actually... heard, we haven't heard anything from him, and what was that? Well... He's not actually elsewhere in the game. <laughs> right. So I I just wanted to mention, because he was the person that arranged the very first track, the title theme that we played. He's a Japanese video game and anime composer, arranger, orchestrator, graduated from university in 91, and went on to work under Koichi Sugiyama, who you might know as the Dragon Quest series lead composer, has been synonymous with the series for 30 mm-hmm. years now. Hayato Matsuo has worked on more than 40 games over his career, often as a freelancer, including titles like the Dragon Quest series, Master of Monsters, Ogre Battle, March of the Black Queen, Dragon Force 2, the Sheer and the Wanderer series, Final Fantasy 12, and many others. But because he's not in-house, you probably have maybe just seen his tracks. He's not as he's not one of these composers that sticks in one place for too long. Right. He kind of bounces around yeah. and picks up uh he's a grifter. Yeah, but he's really good at what he does. Uh, the Final Fantasy XII soundtrack is is actually one of my favorites of the recent games. It's, well, it's not that recent anymore, but uh, yeah, <laughs> date ourselves when we say recent anything because it always <laughs> ends up being like fifteen years ago or something. Anyways, so why don't we get into another track? This is composed by Mariko Namba again. This is from the twentieth anniversary arrangement album, and this is called Seekers Stronghold. That was Seeker's Stronghold from the 20th Anniversary Arrangement Album, composed by Mariko Namba, but arranged by Saori Kobayashi. So I'm not actually as big of a fan of the original version of this track, 
but Kobayashi's arrangement is like the realization of this world. And this is the first time we've taken, we've put the glasses on and kind of seen what this whole Panzer Dragoon saga sound is like in full color or yeah, in full yeah, clarity. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, this is a really good track. And I remember we were talking about this specifically, um, how it does the, the arranged version really makes this track special. I, I mean, not that it was, uh, not a great track or something beforehand. It just, it, it wasn't, it didn't stand out like it does. It really stands on its legs here. And I think that uh, this was an excellent one. We didn't want to leave it out. Yeah. And I think it says something that Kobayashi wanted to actually arrange one of Mariko Nanba's tracks. Like well, she loved it that much that she thought it was worth kind of revitalizing. And I think that's, that's really awesome. Right. So I do want to bring up Tomonori Sawada, an amazing composer and a sound effects artist that got his start at Sega in 1992, composing for and directing tons of different titles across most of Sega's hardware. And although he didn't directly do any of the original music from this game, he was acting as the sound director and worked on sound throughout the entire series, even the director for Panzer Dragoon Orta. So the games he worked on were Sonic 3, he did the title theme, Panzer Dragoon 2, which is the second game, Sega Rally 2 for Dreamcast, uh, Jet Set Radio, Nightshade, and Sonic Riders. Yeah, we wanted to mention him specifically because one of his tracks makes a cameo appearance in Panzer Dragoon Saga. So one of his tracks from Panzer Dragoon Y is the boss theme for the last boss in the game, the uh, Guardian Dragon. Right. You fight the Guardian Dragon in Saga, like fourth or fifth, not really that far into the game, but it uses that track and it's this extremely powerful awesome track and right. i couldn't leave it off of the show yeah it's a good one uh i was i was confused at first when i saw it because i was like wait a minute like that he didn't do any work in this and then i realized yeah oh this is from panzer dragons why so but when i played the game i didn't realize it either so yeah. <laughs> but it's a really good track so let's take a listen this is the expected enemy
That was The Expected Enemy by Tominori Sawada, or The Unexpected Enemy when it's in Panzer Dragoon's Y. <laughs> yeah. It's the same track. You expect it now. Yeah, but now you're fighting it a second time. But Yeah. Um, this, you know, is actually kind of an underwhelming track for a main boss battle. It's an excellent track. Yeah. It's just a very underwhelming final boss battle track. It's kind of strange that it would be this peaceful, <laughs> I guess. Uh, but... I really like this one. I think there's, uh, I, you know, the flute takes the sweet time to get in, which is kind of the star uh, of the of this um, of this piece. But I think that, you know, once it gets going, it's it's really uh, that heartbeat electronic synth bass thing is is so I don't know. To me, it's it it's a very affecting sort of sound and very aggressive and oppressive for this early in the game. I, I, yeah, but it's yeah. not. I don't feel like it's over. I don't feel like it's overwhelming or anything. It doesn't feel no, like um, like it, stress. It is very mellow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For what it is, but it's it just goes to show like that flute melody. You can see how much they built and just a quantum leap in terms of the depth of the sound for Saga. Right, right. Like I like the soundtrack for two, but it doesn't to me hold a candle to Saga. Right. So let's talk about the series. We've mentioned Zvi like. Uh, about 50 times <laughs> yeah it's it's a very good game and even the first game is is very good in its own right and uh it it's kind of the pillars that this game can stand on because it, its legacy and its history uh, have kind of got it to kind of this grandeur status i think as an rpg yeah i would say the first game is pretty easy to get these days there's the original one is still playable uh it comes in panzer dragoon orda i mean you can play it on an emulator too if you want i think it, it it's actually pretty emulatable yeah the first game was this really interesting kind of experiment that sega was going for they needed a new original series and and so, so let, let's talk a little bit about that so the panzer dragoon series was created by yuki futatsugi he was a game designer who joined sega in 91 and after doing what he called menial work for a few years, he put in a proposal for Panzer Dragoon, which was greenlit as a Saturn launch title. So this was like an original IP. He had this idea for this game that was kind of a, you know, this the, the whole thing that we were talking about, this kind of space, kind of world thing. The original blueprint for the, the series that's in Saga started here. It's, it's kind of just building on that legacy. So... He could either have made a racing game or a shooter, and since they had just made Gale Racer, he pretty much had no choice but to make a shooter. <laughs> a shooter instead, right. <laughs> so the game was designed around riding vehicles originally, but he said, why don't we just make it about a dragon? Who doesn't want to ride a dragon? And he wanted a little bit more of a humanistic and soft element, and so that's what made the world kind of what it was. So the original game was really successful, and it led to Zwei and Saga. Interestingly, they were actually being developed at the same time initially. So Zwei and Saga. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so they were they were thinking, we can basically refine the original formula and make another shooter that's a lot better and more polished. And Zwei is a great game. It's right. it's really really awesome. But uh, that makes sense though because yeah. the amount of so the Saturn we mentioned this kind of earlier, but the Saturn wasn't known for its its 3D graphics, and so I'm sure development time was pretty pretty long and, and, and needed to mm -hmm. get the game to where it ended up needing to go and so i think development concurrently with zvi i mean they you know they didn't start probably around the same time but i'm sure there was a ton of overlap right mm -hmm, yeah um i think that's what made the game as as good as it was and pushed the hardware so so well is that they were able to spend a lot of time early on you know kind of zvi doesn't do too much more on top of the the first game it just kind of refines it and perfects it and then Azel, I think, grabs a lot of the the great stuff and then turns it into a world. It's a lot more ambitious of a game, for sure. Right, 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 right. But if you have a chance to play two, you definitely should. I think it's the it's very short. Too. It's the better of the first two games for sure. Like for it, sure. it controls really well. It's it's you know again great soundtrack. So after that, there were a few other games in the series. Uh, just wanted to mention a couple of small games. They had a game called Panzer Dragoon Mini for the Game Gear, which is not really that much to speak about. You can beat it in like 15 minutes. <laughs> there was a Tiger Electronics game for the R-Zone, which I didn't even know Tiger made the R-Zone. I kind of missed <laughs> that entirely. 
Uh, the Game Gear game is a little bit like Space Harrier, and the R Zone game is is kind of like a novelty. It looks a little bit like um, like the Virtual Boy. It's just like a red screen. So <laughs> there's nothing. There's nothing there. So, you know, after after Saga, the next official game was Panzer Dragoon Orda, developed by Smilebit in 2002 with former members of Team Andromeda. That was for the original Xbox. It's a direct sequel, and, and was, as we mentioned, it goes back to that rail shooter style. A refinement of the formula. It's got beautiful graphics. It runs at 60 frames per second. It's got m- more music by Saori Kobayashi, and it's still one of my favorite original Xbox games. Interestingly, Yukio Futatsugi was not the designer for Orda, but he was still a game designer at the time. He actually was the director of Phantom Dust, which was actually a pretty popular game for like 2004. It's a kind of an arena RPG shooter. I never, thing. I never played it. I have no idea. It's a little weird. You control this kind of magic user guy, and you can play in these like arena 90% combat. Percent of games. <laughs> no, no, it was, it's it's really hard to explain. But um, I'll have to look it up. Yeah, Phantom I, Dust. Yeah, I, that one. I think they actually just remade that for the for the Xbox One. They had a like an upscaled port of it recently, hmm. and. He also worked on the spiritual sequel to Panzer Dragoon, Crimson Dragon, for the Xbox One, which also featured music by Kobayashi. I know that one didn't do as well, but if you want more of that rail shooter dragon gameplay, you can at least seek something out. Hmm. Yeah, I never actually played Crimson Dragon. I just know of it. So. Yeah, I, I, I heard the reviews of it were pretty poor, and it was sort of just kind of fell off the radar pretty quickly. Yeah. Hmm. Great soundtrack, though. I've been listening to that a lot lately. Cool. But um, recently it was announced that Panzer Dragoon 1 and 2 were going to get remade. So I've seen trailers. There's no exact date, but the first one's supposed to be coming out at the end of this year. Right. right. Uh, we'll see. I'm pretty stoked. <laughs> yeah, I hope it comes out before the end of the year, but I, they haven't even listed if it's December. I'm guess it's already November when we're recording. I, I'm, so. <laughs> I'm skeptical that it's going to come out yeah. this year, but I mean, you know. Who knows? Looks beautiful. Um, like completely oh, I'm, reimagined. I'm, I'm stoked. I'm I, uh, I'm very excited. So both of those games are coming out for the Switch, and it looks like the company that's doing that is called Megapixel Studio. Couldn't find that much about them. This seems to be their first major project, but the trailers and the gameplay look promising. So I'm yeah. hoping the first game yeah. turns out really well, and then they I'm can stoked. build on it. I mean, yeah. if it sucks, then like, well, never hear from Megapixel again, but. We'll see. Well, <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Anyways, let's get into our next track. This is Pyatt's theme, composed by Saori Kobayashi. Heard Pyatt's theme composed by Saori Kobayashi for Panzer Dragon Saga. That is such a playful and fun track. This is one of my favorites. Me too. It takes some of the town themes, both from Kobayashi and Nanba, and sort of fuses them together. It's it, it just puts a smile on my face every time I hear it. Yeah, um, it's kind of got this like Celtic sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I like that that it it. I mean, it does really sound like a town, 
what part of the game does this play? I'm trying to remember. Was it just was it just that town? Well, Pyatt is one of the main NPCs. There's right, not really right, that right, many right. major ones in the game, but he's like But uh, was it the town? It's in the town. Uh, it's in one of the towns. I don't know if it's in the main town, but he's like this dreamer, aviator guy. He's a little bit like a less uh, cynical Sid from FF7. He's like dreams right. of flying, and he's like, I need you to go fix this engine. Otherwise, how are we going to get off the ground? You've got a dragon? He's this like very uh, <laughs> yeah, animated Pi- guy. Yeah, Pi- Pi- great. Yeah, Pi- and, great. and so the theme totally fits with where, where it is in the game. Right. I, I think so. We've talked about some of the history already in uh, like kind of the development and stuff, but it, it there's a lot more there. I think that we haven't brought up yet because it it relied so heavily on Team Andromeda that had previously worked on the the rail shooters. Mm-hmm. Bringing that small tight knit group over to work on an RPG because they were they were developing them com- concurrently, right? Yeah, two, two, and, two, and, two and, and Saga, and, yeah. And saga. And so having that really small um, dev team working on this brand, this really grand scale project was, especially at the same time as Vi, was uh, a, a pretty massive feat. And then as development started um, progressing and the scope and the scale of the project got bigger and bigger, you know, being at the end of the, the Saturn's lifespan, it, it just, the, all these different components that had to go in to make this game the idea the realization of what needed to be accomplished was uh, a lot bigger than this small team really could do so sega started uh expanding and it ended up being like 50 people strong yeah you know by saga, the end of the by end, the end of the uh development life cycle saga had a notoriously challenging dev cycle uh it's kind of in public record like Number one, the team was really huge, and at the time, the, the the original what dozen people, yeah. So, expanding to fifty people was a big change. I mean, you have so many more communication challenges. You have people who are there were people that were brought in that had expertise in RPGs, and you had the original rail shooter team, and there was a lot of like culture clash between the two. Right, right, and so I think that was definitely something it was definitely a challenge that they had to overcome and i think maybe not in all instances they overcame those some of those (laughs) obstacles but also you know just from a technical standpoint you know the saturn was not known for its 3d capabilities and so even though it was like later on you think they'd figure out most of the the tricks that they could pull in the uh in the hardware you know, really, I mean, the Saturn just was, it wasn't its strong point, but they, they pulled it off, I think, really, really well. Not only that, we have amazing cutscenes that, you know, we saw on, you know, we saw on like stuff like PlayStation and stuff. You know, I compare it to Final Fantasy VII a lot because it's a comparable game around the same time yeah. frame. In Th- fact, they did too. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 you know, in all fairness to Final Fantasy VII, because it was on the PlayStation, the more popular system, it really overshadowed Panzer Dragon Saga, I think, like, a lot more than it should have. Yeah. I mean, it was to the point where I, I think I, I was looking this up. I think it was almost exactly a year between the two games. Right. And... FF7 was such a huge success, it probably single-handedly extended the lifespan of the PlayStation, whereas the Saturn in the U.S. wasn't doing as great, so by the time this game came out, it wasn't going to be enough to turn it around. Exactly. Exactly. But, you know, famously, the the game did actually come out in English, which is which is great. It's, uh, it's almost a game that shouldn't have come it out. It almost didn't, yeah. yeah almost I mean, didn't. like, I think Sega was betting a lot on it, and they knew this was a flagship series. Good luck finding an original copy for this thing. It's like probably a thousand dollars nowadays, maybe Except more. You can look behind you and see my copy, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I bought it when it was like you know not, forty it was, fifty bucks. It was yeah. forty something bucks. Yeah, it's crazy. In fact, I think I even paid less for it because I got it. <laughs> I got it from somebody else. Oh man, the I, I will say one of the things that there's a really good article about the development history called Panzer Dragoon Saga and Oral History, which is on Polygon. And they talk a little bit about some of the stuff about the challenges between the teams. But one thing that I thought was really just crazy is that it took them almost half the dev cycle to nail down the battle system. They redid it like a bunch of times. It worked out. What they finally came up with was really good. But I can imagine how it would have been extremely stressful if you're like a year and a half, two years into development trying to figure out how do we make this work? Right. (laughs) Like, how do you 
repurpose it to fit this genre. It's it's a, it's a challenge, but that, I think they pulled it off. It's just it they must have had to go back to the drawing board several times. I want to I want to know what some of the iter- other iterations were like. Like what did they have in mind that didn't work, didn't make the cut? You know, this is a super random thing, but I remember in the Sega the Sonic Gems collection, they had an early demo of Sonic Extreme that you could play the the canceled infamous yes. Saturn game. Yes. So there's probably somebody out there who has like at least an inkling of what was on there. But actually, that brings up a good point. And this is probably the thing that people most remember Saga for is that because it was the 90s and code practices weren't great, they lost the source code, which is a huge tragedy because there's probably never going to be a port of this game. They'd never heard of Git or... <laughs> no, <laughs> not in 1997 or whatever it was yeah. when they were doing this. Oh, so. God. If you can't find an original copy, I'm not going to tell you how to play the game, but there are ways. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you can, yeah. There, it, it is challenging though. So like if you do have like a modded Saturn or something like that, or yeah, that's if, true. You, if you're using a, um, a modded Saturn, um, you can play the Japanese version, but if you try to play the, like a burn copy on an action replay or something like that, it doesn't handle multi-disc stuff so you can't do it sure so yeah. so um i i all, all i know is i was trying to help somebody else play it at one point <laughs> like one of my friends um and also now i'm like because of the how much mine costs my my original copy costs because i have both the american version and the uh japanese version yeah i'm i'm too afraid to take it out of the, <laughs> the box now like i'm terrified um so it just kind of sits behind you know like over there against the wall well it's lucky but. that you speak japanese because i know japanese copies are a lot easier to come by they're yeah. they're i mean you can find one for 20 30 bucks i think yeah you know, it's not not too bad all right so i think it's time we move on to the main event yeah so we have one more track we're going to play and this is zoa or the village of zoa and then we're going to be talking to saori kobayashi so let's take a listen and we'll be right back was the village of zoa composed by saori kobayashi another really strong track in fact i think this is a fan favorite it's one of the the stronger tracks and all these tracks are so amazing but uh this is definitely one of my favorites and i think uh, a lot of fans would agree totally the way they use all of those folk instruments to create that sense of place i know that's been true of a lot of tracks but this one is sort of central in my mind when i think of saga this is one of the tracks that always comes absolutely. to mind it's so good absolutely well i think it's time that we welcome our guest on we're really excited to be able to um, speak with her about her time working on this game what 20 something years ago now yeah and it's just a incredible opportunity that we're able to um, speak to the person responsible for putting this all together so Kobayashi-san, thank you so much and welcome to the show. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's so good to have you on. First off, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? あ、どうも、小林沙織でございます。<笑> 
楽器のアレンジとか楽譜を出したりもしていますはい。Thank you I'm Saori Kobayashi and I'm a composer I started off composing solely for games but now in addition to that I'm also writing other types of music piano and various instrument arrangements I'm also releasing sheet music Excellent. So, could you tell us about your history with music? Eh, I was a little bit of a kid. 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 叩いてたりしてでその音がどうもすごく正確だったらしいので親がちょっとピアノを習わせてみようかなと。Yeah, Adolf mimic thing I heard and try to play them back on a toy piano I had. And I guess my parents decide to have me start learning piano since it just seems to fit my personality so well. So could you tell us about your musical background?、はい、like what kind of style you're into or if there's any genres that you kind of gravitate towards? そうですね、あのー、それぐらい小さい時からずっとやってきたので、あのー、それなりの時代のそれなりの曲をずっと聴いて、うん、で、あのー、すごくジャズが好きになったんですねあもちろんピアノもクラシックをちゃんと習っていたんですが、はい、同時にジャズも好きになって。I think the attributes to the stuff I listened to as a child, especially that era of music, I also became really interested in jazz. Of course, I was trained in classical music, so was learning more about them at the same time. で、そういう何かこう自分を表現する音楽はあのどんな感じになるかなと思ってあのなるべく作曲の仕事を頑張ってするようにしているうちにゲーム業界に入り。And I thought to myself, how do I express myself into the music and explore it working as a composer? So I joined the game industry and gave it everything I had.、Mm. えー、あの二つぎさんに出会い、えー、パンサードラグンを作ることになって、え、多分だそこからが今の私のスタイルの始まりじゃないですかね。その前の違う時代ももちろんあるんですけど、ね、違う曲のな,なんでかなあのなぜかそうジャズとか大好きなんで。あ、そうですか。<笑> Then I ended up meeting f u t a t s u g i s a n Became involved in Panzer Dragoon. I think that really when I developed my style, you know? I mean, my style has changed somewhat from back then, much more into jazz and stuff. So I want to back up for a second here. What would you say your biggest influences are as a musician, or do you have any specific artists in mind? Ah, t o k n i Ano, Kono Hito, t e u no wa, Nai d e s ne. Hmm, no, especially no. Any bands or anything like that? そうなってくるとちょっと決められないぐらいたくさん出てきてしまうですね。That's even harder. There are too many to even name. うん、まあ、パッとメセニーは好きですね。Actually, I'm a big fan of Pat Metheny, the American jazz guitarist. So, yeah, Pat Metheny. まあ、あのー、まあ、ジャズの人ですけど、パッとメセニーとかが好きだったり、あのー、でも最近のあのー、日本のあのー。なんでしょう女の子の歌うなんかキャピキャピした曲も好きだしあのうんキャリーパミューパミューとか好きですね私あそうですか<笑>どうしたらいいのこれ<笑>なんかポップみたいなそうですねそうですねうん Actually lately I've been really into Japanese idol music the really charged up otaku pop Like I've been to carry Pamu Pamu. So, how did you get started in the game industry? I was in the game industry. 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 I was in the game i n d 仕事をしてたんですけどもそこにあのゲームの仕事が入ってくるようになってであのそれを作っていたら、えー、セガに今引き抜かれちゃったかなみたいな感じで<笑><笑>はい、はい
I actually got my start at a small company my friends had started. It was a music production company, so everything from games, commercials, TV drama. So I was doing that first. Then Sega scouted me to do some of their games, and I ended up joining the company. We're always curious to know this, but what was your experience like working at Sega? What was the overall culture there in regards to sound? Ah, Sega, フリーランスみたいなスタイルで仕事をしていたのであのやっぱりちょっと会社っていうものに入るとあのなんか、まあ、やりたいことがあってもやりたいようにちょっとできないとか。Before I joined Sega, my style was a bit more free or freelance. And the thing about joining a big company is that you don't exactly have the same freedom about your choices, like what you want and don't necessarily want to do. なんか何も仕事してないようになんかあのなんかな給料入ってくるななんか気持ち悪いなと思ってみたりとか<笑><笑>ですけど、はい、うんそうですねでもその代わりあのセガとかそういうあの大きなところに入るとそういう大きな仕事が来て急にわーっとこうあの知られるようになるっていうのはちょっと怖いなと思いました、ね、うんうんそうですね。I mean There are periods of time that I've had nothing to do, so I felt a bit strange getting paid to just be there and not do anything. But on the flip side, it was a bit intimidating early on for me. Working at a big company in a huge building like Sega and getting a real paycheck. How strict was it at the company? Not really strict. Just a large gap between freelance and the company work life. Did certain projects allow you to have more freedom than others, or did it just all depend? Ah, やっぱりプロジェクトによってっていうことですかね。あのフリーランスだと割と自分のこうあのやりやりやすいようなあの仕事とかをあのまあ選んでっていうほど偉くないんですけど、まああのいろいろね自分の形でできるんですけど、やっぱり会社でそういうあのプロジェクトができるとそういうところは通らないので、あのたまにクビになったりしましたプロジェクト。Yes, you know, a lot really depends on the project. With freelance. There are more personalized style and shape you can put into the work, since I guess maybe you have more choice. I'm not sure if that makes sense. But a larger company, you kind of just do what you are told, and you can also get cut from projects. <laughs> like, I'm really bad at sound effects. After doing them once for a project, I was cut off after that. And my boss was like, Yeah, just you know, you're not allowed to do sound effects anymore. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> I like that must have been a little bit of an ego <laughs> bruise. <laughs> Yeah, um, why don't we go ahead and take a listen to our first track that we're going to play here? This is called Wandering from Panzer Dragoon Saga, and this is from the Saturn version. So let's take a listen and we'll be right back. That was Wandering, also titled Nomad, from Panzer Dragoon Saga, 
composed by Kobayashi-san. Such a, uh, I say this so much, but that's such a beautiful track. The the mellow tracks here are just as good as the really upbeat, energetic boss tracks, and I think that's kind of it's hard to pull off well sometimes. There's a lot of instrumentation that just catches your ear in so many different ways, and I think that it's um, kind of a testament to the rest of the soundtrack. You know, having the slow tracks really stay on par with the fast stuff that we're usually more drawn to a more drawn bit. to yeah. yeah and so i think that um you know it's such a powerful um soundtrack to be able to to make this really nice balance between so the spacious two. yeah so kobayashi-san could you tell us your thoughts about wandering or nomad あの、あの、メインテーマの候補として実は作ったんですね。そういう意味では自分でもすごい好きな曲なんですよ、この曲。I mean kind of stray off here a bit. But when I was working on the game, I was really struggling hard thinking about the main theme and how it would end up. This is definitely one of my favorite songs in the game. When working on Azel, I had three main songs or themes in mind. Sonami Village of Zoa and Nomad or Wandering. And this was one of the important ones for me. <laughs> now that I hear it, I should have done this one for the live show instead of the one I'm doing. <laughs> Whatever you play is going to be fine. Yeah. So a lot of the music has a very otherworldly feel. How did you craft the soundscape for the game? あ、そうですね。あの、この時はこれパンツアドラグンRPGで、で、その前までは で、ツバイを参考にしつつ、でもツバイはあのシューティングですから、あの、RPGの方はもうちょっとあの、世界観、物語感、うん、なんかそういうちょっと人の気持ちにこうなんか触れるような、なんかそういうのあの、目指したっ
there wasn't much in terms of planning on the top of that since it was already decided. So for me, it was more or less how I carried the original feeling into the RPG. And the reason I say that is that the development team really didn't have much communication with me in terms of what they wanted since most of the planning was done during Zwei. So most of my communication, if not all of it, was with the sound director. And really even from him, there was little feedback regarding the direction I took things. Basically, like, sounds good to me, or something along those lines. So you didn't get any feedback from the dev team at all? あ、開発チームとはないですね。もう全部あの、サウンドディレクターとのやり取りで。だからサウンドディレクターからあ、ディレクトリックからあ、ディレクターからえ、と、ま、ま、作って、で、あ、いや、もうちょっとここはこういう
just like sound effect. Because of that, I'll be like, ah, the instrument turns out like that. But afterwards, when the things are all together, I think it turns out pretty well, or at least better than I thought. But yeah, creating instrument was not my favorite thing. Yeah, I can imagine that's a really time consuming process. Especially if you really just want to do composition and you don't want to get into the, the granularity of like shaping instruments and stuff like that. You just want to have something and use it. <laughs> yeah, and just fitting it into those strict hardware limitations. Right, right. So let's get into our next track here. This is one of,、uh, this is an amazing one. And this is from the 20th anniversary Arrange album. This is a Tom Dragon, and we'll be right back. Heard a Tom Dragon from the 20th anniversary arranged album composed by Saori Kobayashi. The intensity on that track is just so powerful. And then when it brings in the theme from Wandering in this new context, it's a completely different track. Oh, it's so, it's so, this is such a good one. <laughs> this has a lot of power, and I think this arrangement is just incredible. Yeah, it, it really 
puts this this track on a whole other level. It's a beautiful mixture of the old and the new, sort of the new arrangement on these classic themes. Yeah. So Kobayashi san, tell us about this track and your process creating it. Mm. まあ、ドラゴンドラゴンはもう一番人気の曲だったんでファンの方にとってで、それをどうアレンジするかっていうのが結構、まあ、どの曲もそうなんですけど、やっぱり一番ドラゴンが悩んだと思うんですね。I think Autumn Dragon was probably the most popular track to fans. So I struggled thinking about how to actually do an arrangement of it. The really could be set for all of the arrangement. But yeah, probably the most difficult for Autumn Dragon. あの、例えばその昔やったスタイルをそのままあの、ある程度音を新しくして、あの、やっても面白くないなっていうのもあるし。うん、でもじゃあだからってそれをそのままばーっとこうやってものすごいなんかこう違う風にしちゃってもきっ
developed your your tone and your sound. It's amazing how much a single project can change the course of your career, even when you don't know it. Your at whole the life. Time. It's, yeah, it's like yeah. your whole life. Yeah. yeah. Here we are, 20 years later. うん、あの、コード進行でこんなメロディーでっていうのはものすごく背伸びして無茶して作ってた気がします。当時は。Back then, I stretched myself so hard and also very thin working with the composition and sound. It was a real struggle for me. However, because of that, I was able to build the foundation. うん。<笑> うん、そう、それはだからもう本当にあの、Even while creating this music back then, I always had this sense that I was writing music for another world or other place. Now looking back, I really have to admit that I'm proud of those accomplishments and definitely get a lot of that pride from fans. Well, there's a lot of people that love this soundtrack. I mean, that's why, you know, there's so many people here at this event and uh, really looking forward to your, your live performance. And, and so many people buying the, the 20th anniversary arrangement album and so many people buying all the other soundtracks that were released, you know? Yeah, it really sticks with a lot of people. I mean, it's why we wanted you here in the first place. So going back to Atom Dragon, what was it like revisiting Panzer Dragon Saga for the 20th anniversary release? あ、あの、やっぱり難しかったですよね。あの、今まで色々言ってるようにやっぱり当時の音はすごくあの、ま、望まなかったにしても結果的にすごくいい雰囲気が出てしまったので、で、今どんないいシンセを使ってもあの
That was Four Shriek from the 20th anniversary arranged album composed by Saori Kobayashi. Such a beautiful blend of organic and synthetic elements there. I, I really, really love the, the blending that they have between it. The, the 20th anniversary really just nails the mixture. And, and Kobayashi mentioned it earlier, keeping the ideas alive while giving it a fresh take on it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think this is one of my other favorite tracks. I mean, we purposely catered to uh, the interview a little bit to put some of our, our most outstanding tracks on here, but uh, I think this was um, definitely a killer. あの、あの、まだ当時はあの、どういう形にするかどうか、あの、もう一つ一つが実験で あの、<笑> I really like this song a lot as well. Another one I should have probably done for the live show. At that time, I was experimenting with different sounds and ideas, sometimes doing one by one and or mixing things together. But now, since I've already had the experience and knowledge, it become a lot easier. Like the right string section, the electric brightness of the synthesizer, and also having those worldly, somewhat tribal percussion lines, a slightly directionless melody. So, this is the style That's definitely my favorite style. うん。<笑><笑>もう それよりもなんかファンの皆さんこのトロンとしたメロディーいいのかなとかって思ったりする。私は好きですけど。I <笑> guess instrument that would typically be in the background, I tend to like to put in the foreground and vice versa. So for the arrangement, I couldn't wait to get started. Sometimes I wonder if fans are okay with this though. Wondering or directionless sounds. I like it though. So Kobayashi-san, do you have any current or upcoming projects you can tell us about? So, yes. I think I have a lot of songs in the game. I have a lot of songs in the game. この部分の一曲だけねとか、あのこのこの部分だけちょっとねっていうのはあのちらほらやってるんですけど、あのまとまってやるゲームとかはあのないと言っておきます。秘密です。はい、今いろいろとあのあの言えないものをやっております。ここ
this has been <laughs> such a huge honor to see you and, and meet you here in person. As, as we were doing this interview, it just hit me that like I'm finally talking to one After of my favorite composers. 20 years. I know. I've been listening to this music since like 99, 2000. And, and I know. It's, it's, it's pretty incredible. It's crazy. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. Also want to sincerely thank Alex O'Neill, the CEO and business manager at Brave Wave for facilitating everything. Uh, hopefully this is the start of a great relationship between us and your team. Couldn't make it here tonight, but uh, really nice guy. We got to spend a lot of time together chatting. So yeah, we'll just be seeing him around the holidays again. Hopefully. Yeah, it's thanks to Alex that we were able to make this whole thing happen to bring Kobayashi to MagWest. Right, and right. for that, we thank you a tremendous amount. Yeah, thank you very much. And want to give a special shout out to my wife, Eiko, for being the voice of Kobayashi-san and reading my translations. It's a little bit of a language inception there, but... Uh, <laughs> really appreciate it and know you're busy so thank you anyways let's get into our next track this is again from the 20th anniversary arranged album this is titled tears and we'll be right back That was Tears from the 20th Anniversary Arranged Album, performed by the Triforce Quartet and composed and arranged by Saori Kobayashi. This is such a tearjerker. Uh, the Triforce Quartet, man, they are incredible to watch, too. I These guys are just masters of their instruments like we got we got to, to see them yeah, live yeah, we yeah i to, was about to bring that up if you yeah, weren't we, going to <laughs> no we got to meet them at the library of congress it was a strange place to meet them but it was a very awesome performance yeah after they kind of played in between speaking segments so they would play a track and then we would go up on stage and talk which was it a very didn't make any sense but what it was a very weird and surreal experience i was talking with austin wintery and um rami ishmael yeah I think the video is up, or I hope it is. Anyway, I hope so. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, these guys are just masterful at um, performance, and so uh, such a delicate version of this track. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's very different than. Do you want to listen a little bit of the original, just as a comparison? Yeah, yeah, yeah. still such a good version it is but they definitely played to different strengths with the live instrumentation there it's it sounds so fake after i, mean, uh, I know it's, it's kind of a hard one to go backwards it's still <laughs> yeah. good but it's clear that the the live instrumentation adds just so much depth and dimension to it that you just couldn't get from sample you get those like real like string you know harmonics and tones and timbre and just yeah there's no you can't compete it's just <laughs> On a different playing field. So to wrap up here, today we covered Panzer Dragoon Saga, or Azel Panzer Dragoon RPG on the Sega Saturn, composed by Saori Kobayashi and Mariko Namba. We are recording this 
a little bit after the fact that we've already done the interview and we had that amazing opportunity and we saw Kobayashi san perform live which was an incredible concert it just was a once in a lifetime opportunity um it was a tremendous honor to help put it on in fact i was the guy behind the soundboard and it was probably the it was an out of body experience i oh, was totally i was sitting totally. there and i'm like this is real this is happening yeah we had friends performing up on stage. Yeah, it was really cool. Steamage was up there. My wife, Michelle, performed. Yes, yes. Well, I can't wait to see that video. So Yeah, we'll post a video in the show notes. Big time. If you want to know more about the show, where can you find us, Gene? You can find us online at pixelatedaudio.com for show notes and track lists. We can also be found on Twitter at Pixelated Audio and on Discord. If you like the show, please leave comments or feedback on the website. You can also leave us a review on iTunes or come check us out on Discord. It's been really popular there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got a lot of new folks in all the time. Uh, one of our newest actually is Bedroth and has left us a nice review on iTunes as well. So thank you very much. We appreciate that. If you guys want to help out, you can head over to pixelatedaudio.com slash Patreon or the other way around, patreon.com slash pixelatedaudio and uh, pledge a few bucks. Anything helps and, you know, all that money goes directly into the show. We don't, you know, profit from anything. This is a non-for-profit show. So yeah, that money goes basically to equipment or putting on shows pretty much like this. Exactly. So uh, everybody who has donated so far, thank you very much. And we appreciate your support. Also want to give a special shout out to Barley, our newest patron. Super cool view. Thank you very much. Yeah. And if you're new to the podcast, make sure to check out some of our past episodes. If you like really meaty shows, we've got a lot of RPGs we've done over the years. We have episode 35, Treasure Hunter G. Ooh, that's a way back machine. <laughs> it is. But that was, that was an early favorite of mine. Yeah. There's 82, Lunar, the Silver Star with Noriyuki Iwadare. That's absolutely one of my favorite episodes to this day. Yes, me too. He was just a character to talk to. And then... Uh, Somewhat more recently, we have episode 105. Illusion City. Illusion City. I knew you were going to bring that up. Bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a pretty big show. We, we covered a lot of ground from... Yeah pretty much every single version of that game which is there's quite a few of them yeah so thank you guys so much for listening we have one more track taking out the show gene what do we got so the track taking us out of the show is sonami areru ex sanctu art thou the holy one composed by saori kobayashi with vocals performed by eri ito thank you guys so much for listening and we'll see you back in a few weeks for the next episode